Okay, good afternoon from the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's good to be with the group today. Glad we've got such uh, good participation across the whole US. Um, <clears throat> I'll be talking about a specific technology that we've been working on for about the last uh, 12 to 15 years with uh, Dr. Keith Bowers with Multiform Harvest. Um, this technology was originally developed for use with swine manure. And for the last dozen or so years, we've been adapting it for use with uh, liquid dairy manure. And one of the unique parts about this project is that we um, <clears throat> are not only collecting the product in the form of uh, uh, struvite, which is a phosphorus rich compound, um, and extracting that from the dairy manure, but we're also connecting that product then with the uh, alfalfa industries in our state. So uh, we call it the Mobile Struvite Project. Um, you can find more information about us at this particular website, including some videos. And I'll give you another video link at the end of the presentation. So the, the two primary partners are Washington State University and then Multiform Harvest. Uh, this project was supported largely by the United States Department of Agriculture through the NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant Program. But we also had some matching funds from the dairy farmers in Washington State as well. Uh, trying to get focused on why we've had such an interest for the last, say, 15 years with regard to phosphorus. We know that about 25, 27% of the phosphorus that a cow eats will end up in the milk carton, and that's shipped off farm. That remaining approximately 60% of the phosphorus that the cow eats remains in the manure, primarily in the, the feces, although a little bit of it's in the urine, but from a practical standpoint, we, we deal with manure on the farm, so it's, it's in that manure form. Um, and over time, what we've seen is uh, a beginning to be an accumulation of phosphorus in soils in Washington, in particular in some of our dairy rich counties. So when you take this from a, a, a cow standpoint, then multiply it up. Back in 2002, I did some uh, uh, rough math. And at that time, I had information on the number of cows and the nutrient management plans in one of our uh, northwest most counties up near the Canadian border. Um, and the estimate was that we had about uh, nearly 2,400 tons of phosphorus was eaten by our cows. So that would pencil out to be about 640 tons of phosphorus exported in milk off the farm. So uh, at that time in 2002, we had about 44,000 acres of cropland that the manure was applied to. And so that was leaving a balance of somewhere around uh, 1,724 tons of, of phosphorus. So if we began to then look at the math that was gonna be required, the land base that would be required to utilize that additional phosphorus above the crop needs, it appeared we were gonna need about another 44,000 acres of, of crop land. And with the competition with uh, berry growers and other crops in Whatcom County, it was very clear that we were gonna to need to be looking at a long-term solution for sustainability particularly capturing this phosphorus and exporting it to uh, areas where it, it might have come from to begin with. So a piece of that concept is that uh, up here in this upper left corner uh, is where Whatcom County is. Um, and in our state, we have a lot of alfalfa grown over in this Columbia River Basin side of the state. And so what we do is we, we move a lot of that alfalfa from the east side to the west side. And so what we've been going to do is talk about this concept of now taking this phosphorus that could be collected from manure from cows on the west side of the Cascades and then bringing that back over to the alfalfa growers and other crop growers on the east side. So at least regionally, we're beginning to reconnect this broken nutrient cycle that we've seen uh, over the past many decades. So in terms of the product that's formed, it's, it's called struvite. Um, it is an MPK plus magnesium formula of 629O, uh, and the 10 is the magnesium piece. Uh, it tends to be a slow or medium release uh, phosphorus compound, shown that in a number of our uh, agronomic studies, both in greenhouse and in the field. The water solubility is pretty good, but it's not prone to leaching. So um, I guess you could uh, characterize it as a, tending to be a, a fairly environmentally friendly uh, phosphorus source. The actual process to form struvite, we have our calcium phosphorus that tends to be bound together in the manure, as well as organic phosphorus. 
but we, the inorganic form here of calcium plus phosphorus, we need to break that bond so that we have free calcium and free phosphorus because that a phosphorus has to be in a free form to be able to be um, uh, formed into the compound of struvite. So to do that, we have to use an acid. Uh, currently, we've been doing that with sulfuric. Um, then during the, the phase where we make crystals, we uh, pump this acidified manure up through a cone that's fluidized, uh, has a fluidized bed in it, so it's a, a sand-like material. We'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And at that point, the ammonia that's in the manure, the magnesium that's there, and the free phosphorus can join as we raise the pH and more struvite crystals are grown. Um, I might note that with the swine manure, uh, because they have much lower calcium, this pH reduction step um, appears not to be necessary. So on, the, on swine operations is a much easier process. Um, okay, this is what the product actually looks like. Uh, here on the left-hand side is a quarter, so it gives you a, a, an idea of the relative size. So it's a very sand-like material. When it's drained from the cone, it's um, damp, but not, uh, not really wet, so it, we get good dewatering. And so that makes it a fairly friendly material for export off farm, and uh, transportation costs certainly would be much less than a material that's got a lot of water in it. Okay, so the technology, again, to form the struvite, it's a crystallization process. Um, it's called a fluidized bed, that's the engineering term, and it's in a cone shape. Uh, the particular system we'll show you that we're using on these farm-to-farm -farm demonstration trials is about 32,000 liter cone. Uh, we lower the pH down to between 5 and 5.4 with sulfuric, and that's again to release the phosphorus away from the calcium. And then as it's pumped up through the cone, um, we can either add ammonia or caustic soda. In the trials I'll show you today, We've been using sodium hydroxide or the caustic soda. And then we move that pH up between seven and eight. Um, in our pretreatment tank where we lower the uh, pH of the manure with acid, we also put in some magnesium. Uh, typically we'll use magnesium chloride. And again, that's to make sure we've got a good ratio of magnesium to phosphorus so we get a good struvite formation. So a bit of a cartoon caricature of, of the process up here at the top. We start with the cow. If you remember, we got about 60% of what that cow eats in terms of phosphorus is going to end up in this, this manure. We pull um, in our state, uh, almost all of our manure in, in our farms is handled with a, a manure lagoon. So we have a, a lot of liquid being used. So we pull out the large particle solids. Then this um, manure that Fluent that comes out of that liquid solid separation phase, then come down. We put it into this pre treatment tank here. In this pre treatment tank, we'll add in the acid and we'll add in the magnesium source and um, allow this to circulate for a few hours and then we'll uh, I'll let it settle for anywhere from one to three days. Um, once that has occurred, then we've got a, a settled uh, material on the bottom which has a lot of material we don't want to be pumping through the cone. Then we'll then transfer this material uh, up through the cone. So we, we pump it in here in the bottom of the cone. There's a, a bead of seed, uh, a bed of seed crystals in here in the lower portion so that whenever the manure is pumped up through, it tends to keep this uh, bed floating and it's just kind of a fluid, uh, fluid, fluidized bed. Um, once we've run the, the system for a few days, we can then actually sh turn the system off open a valve at the bottom, and we can let this uh, bed of material then flow out and let it dewater. And then the idea is we uh, put it on trucks and haul it eastern, to eastern Washington via I-90. Um, and then the liquid portion that's been, uh, had the phosphorus removed, then can go back to the manure lagoon. It can be used for uh, manure source, nutrient source on the farm. Okay, so this is what the, the system actually looks like. This is a 24 foot trailer, uh, about eight feet wide, so it's something we can haul down the road easily. Uh, the cone itself is on a uh, hydraulic uh, lift arms here, so it takes about 60 seconds for this to either lower or to raise back up. We've got some inter interconnect electrical skid here in the middle of the, the trailer. 
uh, we found out is we needed to be ready to either hook up to 220 or 440 as we went to any given dairy. So on one side of the skid, uh, we have two 220 connections and on the other side is 440. I got some uh, tanks on the, the system for water, various chemicals, and then in the, the front portion on the far side is where all of our chemical pumps and so forth are located. So it's a pretty well self-contained system. And it's allowed us to easily travel it down the road and not deal with a lot of Department of Transportation issues. Um, so over this last year, we tested manure from 30 dairies. And the factors that we found that per, uh, affected the performance the most were per, percent suspended solids, uh, calcium content, obviously. Iron can be a problem in certain situations. If there's a real high iron water, for instance, or for some reason they, they had iron coming in at another source, um, it can create some problems with uh, the capture of phosphorus in the struvite. Certainly the ratio of orthophosphate to total phosphate in the manure, we know that we can capture more total phosphorus from a manure that's gone through an anaerobic digester than manure that has not gone through a digester. And the reason for that is that in um, manure that's gone through an uh, anaerobic digester, a lot of the organic phosphorus is digested in that process of making the methane. And so we have more of the total phosphorus will be in this orthophosphate form. And then the other thing we, we did run into uh, this last summer when we were running some of our analyses on the east side of our state, uh, whether it's rather warm and hot uh, and, and arid, we lost a lot of ammonia out of the manure in the lagoons that we were looking at. And so we found some situations where we think that we actually had ammonia concentrations were a bit too low to get a really good uh, struvite formation. So um, real value in going around and looking at 30 dairies, you get a whole lot better feel for uh, just all the practical considerations you're going to deal with. So with regard to peer removal, we looked at it a couple different ways. Um, basically, we wanted to either look at the reduction in orthophosphate between samples that went uh, before the cone and those that were coming out, or we looked at total phosphorus. Um, and, and is an initial way of looking at this uh, efficiency of P removal. In 17 of the runs uh, where the reduction in ortho P was a positive, at least at the time points that we sampled, the average reduction was a 37%, and it ranged from about one to 88. Now on the high end, the 88 is from manures that had been anaerobically digested. So it, it again clearly shows that with digested manure, you can capture a lot more of the phosphorus. On the, if we estimated the, uh, the total P reduction um, and 17 runs where that was positive, we were showing about a 30%, 29% uh, reduction in, uh, in phosphorus with a range of about 1.5 to 86. Again, same kind of ranges. And again, the high end of 86% is certainly gonna be from a manure that's gone through an anaerobic digester. So analysis of the actual struvite to come out uh, when we harvested these beds, in brackets down here below, this is the fertilizer formula for pure uh, struvite, so 629010. And from the 25 struvite samples we uh, looked at, we had a, a number of about 4.524, 07.4. So we've got a product that's uh, uh, probably in excess of 80% pure. Uh, we felt pretty good about that and um, give a, you know, a product that's certainly going to be valuable from a fertilizer standpoint. <clears throat> So we also looked, another characteristic uh, that we've looked at on struvite, and this was recommended by one of our <clears throat> former colleagues that worked with us on these studies, <clears throat> Dr. Bob Stevens, was to look at the citrate soluble phosphoric acid. Um, it's used as a, a practical estimate of phosphorus that's re readily available to the plant. And when we looked at that, uh, data from 18 of the struvite samples indicated about 25% of that phosphorus was this readily available citrate soluble. Um, and so that would give us a good indication of, of, again, the readily available P that's in the material for plants um, when used as a fertilizer. Okay, so I'm now gonna talk a little bit about the agronomic side. Um, this was a part of the project that I thought we might take a while for us to get some real traction and get some interest. Um, it turned out that our alfalfa growers were actually uh, very willing to, to work with us. This is a, a picture here on the left of some of the application on some of the large fields that they had. Um, <clears throat> so we had two different operations. One 
uh, characterized here in the upper right hand panel, uh, a farm that was going to be doing a new seeding. And we put uh, in 2017, uh, late summer, 64 pounds of phosphorus was put on. Um, and it was either in the form of a control, we used monomonium phosphate, which is 1152O formula. And this was the pounds per acre that was applied to get the 64 pounds of P. And then for the struvite, uh, only we had 221 pounds of that. And that particular formula on that product was a 629, uh, 9.8 when we analyzed that. So again, targeting is 64 pound. Um, we also had an opportunity on an established stand. And so in 2017, we applied either 30 pounds or 75 pounds on the two portions of those fields. And um, so for the uh, control, we had uh, 57 pounds of MAP, monomodium phosphate that went on, no struvite. And then for this established stand, we put on a, a ratio of about two thirds uh, to three quarters of the total phosphorus that went on was in the form of struvite. And um, the smaller portion was uh, in the form of monomonium phosphate. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, the actual fields uh, that we're dealing with. So in terms of uh, the established stand, and then looking at the data, um, and I'm gonna focus just on the forage yield data today because of time, but we do have uh, soil, soil information as well. But the yield in terms of tons per acre uh, in 2018 were 7.5 tons, for the struvite and 7.14. So maybe a slight advantage here for, uh, for the struvite, but certainly a very comparable yields. Percent phosphorus in the dry matter, uh, 0.32 versus 0.31. And then when we calculated out some P uptake, um, it would suggest that we're about 39 pounds versus 38. So really nice response and, and certainly the producer was happy with this. On the uh, new seeding field, we were able to get data from two of three cuttings. So that's why you see the lower yields here. But again, at 2.95 tons and 3.08 tons. So we're right here at approximately the same amount. Percent uh, phosphorus in the uh, forage, 0.28 versus 0.27. And then phosphorus uptake per, uh, per acre, about 16 and 15. So again, very comparable, whether it was a new stand or whether it was an existing stand. So uh, you can view some short videos about our project um, at this particular website. So it's, um, the only thing that's different about this link versus the previous one I showed at the very beginning is that add in this resources uh, here at the end and that'll get you right to the page where, where the videos are located. 